Ricardo Hausmann, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's really an honor. I've been a, a fan of your podcast for a very long time and of your book, so it's really an honor to be with you today. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm a fan of your writing at, at Project Syndicate and, and many other places. Um, uh, you know, economists um, have always studied the division of labor, right? I mean, at least from the time of Adam Smith, that has been central to uh, uh, how economists think about the world. You're interested in the, in the division of labor, but in a particular kind of way, in the way in which we sort of divide the labor of knowledge across society. Um, what does that mean and how does that help us understand the world? Well, if you if you think just uh, what's happened over the last uh, couple of centuries, maybe the last millennia, uh, you know, there's been a massive explosion in knowledge. Uh, you know, we just, you know, so, uh, humans know so much more than they ever did, but our individual capacity to know has not expanded. So, you know, uh, from the time of uh, Isaac Newton or Adam Smith, uh, you know, knowledge has exploded, but no one of us pretends to be smarter than Isaac Newton or Adam Smith. And uh, and so where is this knowledge? And, and the idea is that uh, what societies have done is that they have put different bits of knowledge in different heads. And, and, and by putting different bits of knowledge in different heads, the whole knows more than the parts. But then if you want to use that knowledge, you have to bring these heads together. You have to sort of put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And so, so that's sort of like how I see society. The nature of society is this nature of, of networks of collaboration that are needed because we just are individually inept. We are individually useless. We can only do things in uh, by collaborating with others, and and we can only use the knowledge by tapping into the knowledge of of uh, others, and that's sort of like the human, the modern human predicament. Oh, that's really interesting. So I'm trying to think sort of where the contrast lies, right? If you go back a number of centuries, you know, a farmer may not have had religious knowledge for which he needs, uh, you know, a priest or something like that. He may have lacked like, certain kinds of knowledge about his farm. Perhaps there was a kind of you know, elder in the village or somebody particularly wise who you would go to if your crop is, you know, failing to, to ask for advice. But basically, the farmer from, from experience, from be growing up on a farm and so on, would have known pretty much what, 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 what he has to do sort of throughout the year and from morning to evening in order to grow the food. And then he could sort of subsist of the food to some extent, right? Um, today, the, the extent to which, you know, uh, you know, I am uh, making my living from teaching college students and from, you know, talking about the world on, 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 on podcasts, but um, I don't actually make any money from the podcast, but um, uh, that, um, uh, you know, I don't have any idea really how the food gets to me, right? I mean, I know I can go to the supermarket or I know I can, when I'm being lazy, order something on DoorDash, but there's such intricate processes sort of hidden in the background that you really sort of rely on everybody else to do that. What are the implications of that? I mean, once we take that seriously as an insight, how should that shift our view of politics, of, of economics, of, of, of everything else? Well, I mean, um, uh, one interesting question to ask is, what is your radius of interaction? Who do you interact with? So in, in you know, in pre-modern times, you know, if you lived in a village, you interacted with people in the village. Maybe, you know, there was a priest that came from outside the village and shared some information was not in the village. But essentially, you had a very narrow sets of interactions. And one of the telltale signs of that is is the fact that if you if you talk to people, you know, language evolves. Uh, and but you still need to be understood by the people you talk to. So, so one of the consequences of that is that you have a plethora of languages. That uh, that, for example, in a country like Cameroon, you have like 320 languages. It's just a reflection of the fact that for a very long time people haven't been talking to each other. They haven't been interacting with each other. So suddenly, you know, when capitalism comes and you know uh, there are many more products to be made, you want to have bigger markets. Then, then suddenly you want to interact with um, many, many more people, a, a broader community, right? Uh, and so, so you need to have uh, a way of connecting to people who are much farther away from you, uh, who may not necessarily speak your language or, or share your beliefs, etc. So you need, you need to be able to connect to many. 
you need, in some sense, a broader sense of us. So if you look at the history of Germany, for example, where you were born, you know, uh, the first thing that happened in 1815 was that they invented the Zollverein, the, the customs union. And, and, and the idea of German nationalism was the idea not, not of, it's not like Basque nationalism that, you know, we want to separate from the rest of Spain. No, German nationalism was, you know, we're separated into these, I don't know, hundreds of, of, uh, of, of small uh, um, uh, jurisdictions and we want something bigger. We want something united. All right. So, so you need a, like a broader sense of us. But uh, capitalism also required to agree on a bunch of things on, 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 you know, uh, what gets taught in school, what's the proper grammar, uh, where do rails go through, uh, you know, railways go through and, and, and so on. So, so you needed to agree on more things with more people. So you needed kind of like a deeper sense of us. And so uh, capitalism had, uh, has been struggling with the idea. See, we need polities that are much bigger than we ever had in history uh, that, uh, um, because they're broader, they're more heterogeneous. Uh, but because there's more things that we need to agree on, they have to also be deeper. And so there's been always this conflict between having a bigger polities that allows you for bigger markets and, and narrower polities that are, allows you for a deeper understanding. That's, that's, that's really interesting. I think that's a really helpful uh, frame to, to, to look at the modern world and some of the problems in it and obviously some of the great accomplishments of our economic system. I have one sort of question about it. So, you know, when I actually go back to this farmer that I'm picturing in a village a number of centuries ago, uh, there was already some real forms of division of labor, right? So, um, you know, perhaps he baked his own bread, he probably did a bunch of things around his own farm, but, you know, there would still have been certain kinds of professions in the village that he interacted with, uh, the, the, perhaps a baker, perhaps a bricklayer, um, uh, uh, you know, perhaps some kind of merchant that brings out goods from the outside. Perhaps he sells some of his surplus product to that merchant. And so it's true that, you know, the only people who this farmer would need to interact with are basically people from within his own village. And so if it's a country, uh, or what today would be a country, of 300 languages, it doesn't matter as long as everybody within that village speaks the same language. So in a sense, his... Uh, knowledge, his acquaintance was much more narrow than ours is today. On the other hand, of course, he knew people in the village across the existing professions very well. He spoke to a priest on Sundays mm -hmm. and he negotiated with a bricklayer and sort of everybody within his actual realm who did have a different sort of specialization, he knew on a quite intimate basis. Now, when I think about the world that we live today, you know, you grew up, I imagine, speaking pr predominantly Spanish. I grew up, uh, you know, going to school in German and speaking Polish with, with my parents. And here we are in the lingua franca of the 21st century speaking to each other in English on a third continent from where we each grew up, right? Mm -hmm. I know an amazing number of people in the world who are in a similar line of work to me, who are academics or journalists who think about politics and ideas and who, you know, may have grown up in completely different cultures, speaking completely different languages, and, and, you know, I can email them easily. I can get on a Zoom call with them. I think about the world with them. And that's all amazing and inspiring. And it shows sort of <laughs> the breadth of communication we have. Of course, I know virtually nobody who lives close to me who actually provides me with my food, who actually, you know, helps me with the kinds of services that I take for granted that I sort of contract out, right? So, so I guess in part, we have this broader circle of acquaintances. We have a, a broader knowledge. But it's also much more specialized knowledge, right? We know people within our field extremely well, sometimes with really global networks. But the people who actually carry out the division of labor and sustain much of the things we need in order to keep the electricity on and keep the water running in our taps and have food on our table, we're much less likely to know than we would have been a number of centuries. So that sort of, I guess, changes the way in which society is stratified. Obviously, society was deeply, deeply stratified 300 years ago, so I don't want to be naive about it, but the kind of way in which it's stratified and the kind of way in which people do or don't know each other seems to radically change um, as the sort of division of knowledge increases as well. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we know many, many more people from farther and farther away uh, that are closer to our areas of intellectual interest 
and we know less and less people who are farther away from our areas of intellectual interest. In, in the good old days, it was kind of like required, expected. It was a social norm that you would go to church. And in church, you would find different segments of society uh, sharing an experience. Uh, and, and that experience, in some sense, reminded everybody that they were in, in contact with one another, that they were dependent somehow on one another. And that, those forms of, of solidarity, maybe we have substituted for, you know, we are now, we, we believe that uh, all humans are, are brethren and we, 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 we belong to a global community and, uh, and, and we, and one with nature and so on, but much less uh, a sense of obligation, a sense of, uh, of loyalty uh, to those that live around us. And um, some people have thought that that might be one of the reasons why uh, uh, you have had the populist backlash, that parts of society uh, are much more dependent on these local interactions, and, um, uh, but the people that they interact with are no longer care about them. Uh, and these are typically the people uh, with, uh, you know, advanced expertise on, you know, intellectuals and stuff. So, so the bonds of trust with the intellectuals get uh, disrupted, and uh, and then societies are, are less willing to uh, to tolerate uh, the kind of positions, the kind of roles that the intellectual or, or professionals or experts uh, uh, can play in society. Yeah, so you, you thought about this in terms of sort of a role of prestige in society um, and uh, the idea that was suggested by Paul Collier and others that, uh, you know, the sort of professional class has uh, uh, sort of shifted where it draws its prestige from and what kind of identities it's invested in. And it's become less invested in the national identity or less invested perhaps in the local identity in the particular town they happen to be in. Um, and more invested in the kind of professional prestige they get from being academics or being, uh, you know, tech workers or being management consultants or whatever kind of profession they they, they may be in. Um, and so is this sort of, uh, you know, when, when, when you think of populism as being in part uh, an erosion of trust uh, in, or if, if you think of the reasons for the rise of populism, as being in part an erosion of trust among uh, a lot of voters uh, into uh, sort of governing elites and uh, established institutions. Um, you know, is it that they perceive those institutions to be governed uh, by people who uh, have less and less in common with them, less and less contact with them, um, and perhaps identify less with common identities or characteristics uh, like nationhood? Do you think that that is a significant part of what explains the rise of populism? It, it's a, to me, it's, a, it's still a puzzle. It's sort of like outside my area of comfort. I'm a card-carrying economist, and I, I, I think of economic problems in the world. We, we, we'll, we'll forgive uh, you. I, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, so, for example, economists believe that, uh, you know, things are organized uh, in, in a way that, uh, you know, um, you care about yourself, but you're structured in a way that uh, indirectly you care about others because in order for you to care about yourself to earn a living, you have to do things for others. And and they have to buy stuff from you and, and how much they buy from you at what price they're willing to pay for your stuff depends on what you did for them. So so we're all living in this, um, in, in this world in which we're in principle, interacting with other people through through market exchanges, but then again, you and I are academics, and we work in in academic institutions which are supposedly not for profit, and actually among the top uh, 100, 500 universities in the world, none of them is for profit. So, so we live in the in 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 the, in a world that is not very market based in our personal lives as as university professors. Um, uh, uh, and in, there's an interesting theory uh, by Luis Garicano, who used to be a professor at the University of Chicago, then became a, a member of uh, the European Parliament for the for this uh, party uh, Ciudadanos, this uh, center-right party in, in in Spain. But his idea was that um, 
And the reason why uh, you know the profit motive doesn't work in in universities is that we are generous with our knowledge. That is, you know, people send us a paper, we share comments with them, and 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 we ask questions in seminars, and then we get answers, etc. So we're very generous with our knowledge. Um, and and if you if you had you know if you put a profit motive there, saying you know I ask a colleague a question and he says okay, but what's in it for me? So like the whole thing breaks down. So so we really live in a in while we theorize about the market, we don't really live in a market. We live in a place where we are very generous with our knowledge. And uh, and the question is uh, so if you are a, a military leader. Uh, you're supposed to protect the nation. You know, uh, we're we're going to recognize a lot of stuff from you. You know, give you importance and so on. Think of a general in Ukraine right now. Uh, well, we expect you to be super generous with your knowledge because you're defending the nation. You're doing something for us, right? And in some sense, we pay you by recognizing your status in society, by recognizing your prestige. And according to uh, to my friend and and uh, and colleague uh, uh, Joseph Hendrich, uh, prestige is a human universal, uh, but it's not shared with primates. So it's it's uniquely human, as opposed to other feelings like you know, sexual desire or alpha male dominance and so on, which many species have. Prestige is kind of like uniquely human, and we have to ask ourselves the question: You know, how does this? kind of prestige equilibrium uh, uh, sustain itself. And interestingly enough, uh, at different points in time, it's it comes under attack by either the left or the right. So, for example, what was the Cultural Revolution about? It was, you know, anybody who knew was a, a counter-revolutionary. And uh, and we, we the students took over universities and taught uh, professors what they were supposed to learn and so on. Uh, and and the same thing a little bit. This hatred of prest uh, of of knowledge of expertise uh, happened, you know, with Trump and uh, and the American right and the British right that uh, you know not trusting the economists who would said Brexit was going to be complicated and would would be costly. Um, so this this uh, uh, rejection of of knowledge. A, of, of expertise a, a, may cause these breakdowns of, of um, social relations, which cannot happen through market exchanges, but that need to happen through this uh, this process whereby uh, we recognize, you know, we pay people for the generosity with which they share their knowledge, not with money, but with some kind of status, some kind of recognition of importance. That, that's 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 really interesting. I have a kind of side thought. Uh, about universities, which is that, um, you know, a common criticism of a way that universities currently function is that they've become too marketized, that in a sense they've become too capitalist. Um, and I think that that's, uh, you know, true in certain respects, like the fact that, you know, many of the most well endowed universities are basically, you know, hedge funds with some, you know, academic functions attached and so on. <laughs> Um, but I think when it comes to what academic life actually looks like and the incentives for academics, that's getting it wrong in a substantial way. Um, so it used to be that you had a kind of aristocratic or feudal model of academia, which I think had many shortcomings, but also some genuine strengths, right? So in a place like Cambridge or Oxford mm -hmm. until a number of decades ago, you know, somebody decided you're smart either because of competitive examinations or perhaps because of sort of you know, more forms of favoritism and prestige games or whatever, and they gave you basically a lifelong job when you were 23 or 24. And after that, you were a don, you were a fellow at one of these colleges, you were never going to make much money, but you were given a kind of pseudo aristocratic life, probably didn't have a family. And most of those fellows never produced anything of worth. But if you did, because they had the luxury to spend decades on a book, to go and research whatever they want. So it was a kind of semi-lottery system within talented people um, to have this privilege. And then if you did, you know, it really paid off for society in some cases because some people were really able to convert that and, and, and many were not, but they all had to do quite a lot of teaching. So they, so they were all useful in terms of uh, educating the next generation. Now that's an imperfect model, but it's one with genuine strengths. It creates this one space in society where people are protected 
from any form of market pressure to pursue ideas and knowledge and pass some of that knowledge on. And even for most of them, we're not nearly as productive as the average professor at an American university today. Um, some had the space to create generally important ideas. Now, I think when you look at what it looks like to be a PhD student at an American university or tenure track professor at an American university, or in certain ways, even a tenured professor at an American university, I think it's very, very different. It's a pseudo market. There's no actual market incentives. If you're able to make your university a lot of money, that doesn't really matter. Most, at least in the social sciences and the humanities, nobody makes their university a lot of money. If you're able to get a university in the national newspapers um, and attract students and sustain the prestige of the university, that doesn't really particularly matter. Nobody particularly cares. What matters is the pseudo market of academic publications. And those are judged by a small number of your peers. Um, they may only be read by 20 or 30 people, but as long as you, you know, continue to publish at a steady rate in those kind of journal articles, even if you're not cited a ton, even if people forget about your articles in a few years, that you have to keep doing in order to be promoted. Whereas teaching at most uh, uh, prestigious universities, at least, is, is barely encouraged. In fact, a very common piece of advice that tenure track professors get is, for God's sake, don't spend too much of your effort and too much of your time teaching that's going to distract you from the things you're really evaluated on when you go up for tenure. So I think a truly capitalist university would have many disadvantages, but may have some advantages. At least you would be incentivized to talk and speak about things that seem to be of broad interest. A sort of pre-capitalist university that we used to have, um, I think, had many advantages. I think a lot of uh, the academic life at, at, at universities, at least, is pseudo-capitalist, where you're subject to this really idiosyncratic market that doesn't actually uh, face any financial pressures and that really is a kind of uh, taste, or, you know, a club of taste of a small number of uh, professional insiders who get to decide what gets published in some journal that nobody reads and that's only sustained because universities have to pay enormous access fees to these universities. Um, is, am, have I gone nuts? Is this too populist a critique of a current model of universities? What do you think, Ricardo? And then we'll get back to the real topic. So le let me say that uh, I, uh, I think uh, capitalism, modernity, technological development have really uh, transformed the universities in, in interesting ways. And there are parts of the university that reflect what you what you uh, just uh, referred to, uh, and parts that don't. Uh, um, by the way, you know, I, people would have in in, the, in parts of the university they would have told you, "Don't do podcasts. Don't write popular books. Focus on on your you know the the really uh, uh, Im, important academic journals in this narrow field that, as you say, twenty people read." I, I know but, because that's what I what I was taught consistently <laughs> when, when I was a PhD student. Often in sort of good, you know, I mean, I, I, I I'm very grateful to 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 yeah. everybody who taught me when I was a grad student and 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 actually many of wonderful teachers. It's not yeah. that they look down on it. It's not that they thought I was wrong with it. My my analogy for it is always that you know if if they'd known that I kept you know climbing mountains, they'd say you know it's really impressive that. You know, you, you have this goal of climbing Mount Everest or something. I mean, that's really cool. Let's talk about it over coffee. But isn't it a bit of a distraction to your academic work? Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, it's not that yeah. it's bad. It's just that it's it's nothing to do with, with a core mission of universities. Absolutely. But, uh, but th this is where you see uh, uh, capitalism transform things. Because, um, uh, you know, I'm a professor of public policy and I... I don't imagine how you can do public policy, think about public policy, uh, uh, unless you engage with the world. Okay, so so you know I've created something called the Harvard Growth Lab. It's like fifty people work there. You know, typically as a professor, you wouldn't create an organization of fifty people inside a university. You have to pay fifty salaries. You know, where are you going to get the money? How how do you sustain that effort? And and I have this metaphor. That um, uh, you know that uh, public policy is to economics, uh, say what medicine is to biology. Uh, you know, uh, developments in biology are great for medicine, and developments in economics are great for public policy. 
uh, but you would not go get treated by a biologist uh, because the biologist doesn't know uh, the kinds of things you would need to know to treat the patient. And, and the same thing with public policy. Yeah, it's great to know economics, but uh, uh, public policy implies a synthesis of a set of, of, of knowledge things that, that, uh, that are different uh, uh, from, say, a, a wet lab in biology. And uh, we don't train uh, doctors the way we train biologists. Uh, the only way we know how to train doctors is to send them to a teaching hospital. And that teaching hospital has real patients. Uh, that teaching hospital doesn't think it only is about treating those patients. It thinks it's also about forming the next generation of doctors, but it's also about doing research so that it's not just these patients that happen to be there, but they want to change the way uh, treatment is done, the way diagnostics are done for everybody in the world. So they want to change the way the profession is done. So I think that in, 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 you know, in medicine, in engineering and so on, it's very hard to advance unless you engage with the world. And you need these, uh, this university engagement with its outside world, which is very different from, say, you know, theoretical physics or in other parts that, that have this idea that, you know, with pen and pay, uh, pencil and paper, that you can, you can do a lot uh, by just thinking. And, and I think that we live in this, in this combination of spaces. And that's why some parts of the university are much more engaged with the outside world because actually they, their, their networks of operation depend on these connections with, with the places in the outside world where things are happening. And I think that you are also a connector between this world, this world of practice out there where people are trying to make sense of the world in which they live. And you are, from a university perspective, you know, a, a useful contributor to that that outside network. Well, but I wonder whether that view is a little bit overly rosy because of where you sit in the university and where I also sit at the university. So we're both professors of a practice, which are great and lovely positions. Um, but which are quite atypical. I mean, you know, you can't be a PhD student aiming to become a professor of a practice. Um, uh, you know, you can do interesting things in the world, and then, uh, you know, if you're successful, you might be appointed to such a position. But, you know, when you look at who policy schools actually hire as tenure-track professors, they're by and large, uh, you know, many economists and many political scientists um, so it's as though, you know, the, the people t you know, hired at the teaching hospital are all biology PhDs who've never had a patient. Um, and, and it's not clear to me that that's the best model. So I agree with you that there are corners of universities that do that kind of translational work. And I think we're both lucky to have wound up in those corners. But, you know, we both got there by rather unusual paths. You, you got there in part by being a government minister, right? That, that's not the standard model. Um, for, for how you become a, a professor, even at a, at a public policy school. Perhaps it should be. Um, I want to go beyond sort of our parochial concerns about universities, though. You mentioned that you're uh, running this, 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 this growth lab. Um, so, Professor, uh, how do you have economic growth? Well, uh, you know, it all goes back to this framework that I think that, uh, you know, uh, societies uh, are rich because of what they know how to do. Uh, you know, I was born in Venezuela and we all thought we were rich because we have oil. And then that's what makes you rich. And oh, how come, you know, Bolivians would say our country is rich, uh, our Bolivians are poor. Uh, who took the money? Or, you know, why, why is that? Well, I mean, the truth is that you can have stuff under your ground, but that's not what makes you rich. In fact, uh, um, we didn't know that we had stuff under our ground uh, until, you know, American companies were kicked out of Mexico and looking at another place to look for oil. And uh, and oil was useless un unless somebody invented uh, uh, the internal combustion engine and cars and, and stuff. Before that, it was used for uh, to make kerosene for lighting and, and then electricity kicked it out. So so it's this this notion that um, that wealth somehow depends on on natural resources when when 
the, the, the core of wealth is what societies know how to do. It's, it's the knowledge in those societies. So the process of growth is really the process of growing the knowledge in that society. And it's less about, I mean, too much of the profession, my profession has gone, oh, yes, it's knowledge. Obviously, we know it has to be do with education. So we need to raise education levels. And we need to improve the quality of education. We need to get better scores in PISA exams and so on so that, you know. But this is exactly not where the big action is. The big action is not so much in how much does the average person know, but in how different it is what different people know. How much does of the knowledge field is spanned by the sum of what everybody in society knows. So in principle... Richer societies know how to do more things, and among the things they know how to do, they know how to do more complicated things. So the process of growth is the process of learning how to do more things, and among them, more complicated things. It's a process of diversification. We see it. It's easy to measure in the kinds of, of things that a society makes, or a society makes well enough to be able to export them. It's sort of like super visible there. But, but that's just, in my mind, a manifestation of networks of humans that know how to do things well. And, and it's the growth of those, of, of that network. And, and those things so how are do you, mostly... Just, yeah. just to stay on education for a moment. So how do you boost that? I mean, thinking about public policy, I can understand if a, if, if, if a problem is, you know, this is a very poor country. It has a literacy rate of 50% and, you know, very few people can do sort of... Um, uh, you know, an advanced level of math or a moderate level of math, um, you know, great. So we'll invest a lot in education and we'll, you know, have a much more educated workforce and that's going to fix the problem. That's very hard to carry out. It's hard even to roll out a uh, high quality secondary education system at scale in part because of monetary reasons. And in part, of course, if you have an education that's not very educated, it's going to be hard to recruit the high quality teachers who are going to be able to educate the next generation. But we have lots of models for how to do that. Lots of societies have managed to go through the transition from being a mostly literate to a very literate society. If I buy what you just said, then as a policymaker, my task becomes even harder, right? I mean, how do you create a society in which uh, it's not just better PISA scores, it's not just better reading proficiency or math proficiency in grade nine or grade 10, it's this great distributed network of the right kind of knowledge that covers lots of things and you know gives us a general aptitude in doing things how 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 do you how do you create that how have societies improved on that metric and what can policymakers do to boost that along so so it's very interesting that uh, this thing that you say is very hard to educate society it is extremely hard to educate society but it's something that the world has done it's amazing. If you look at all indicators of education, there's been massive convergence in, in the percentage of people with high school degrees and the percentage of people with college degrees, with postdoctoral degrees. It, you know, I come from Latin America and Latin America has converged in all of these dimensions. Latin America has converged in a bunch of other socio-demographic dimensions. It's more urbanized. It's more, I mean, female labor force participation is, has converged with U.S. levels. Fertility rates have converged with U.S. levels. All these other dimensions of, of development, they have converged with U.S. levels. Incomes per capita have not. So, uh, so it, it, it's not so much about a, um, how much on average people know. It's this other process of, we call it in economics, the extensive margin. The, uh, uh, how does, you know, if your country doesn't know how to make watches, uh, how does your country start making watches? Well, uh, to make watches, you need watchmakers. Uh, but you cannot become a watchmaker in a country that doesn't make watches. Where Who's going to train you as a watchmaker? So... So, so the process involves solving these chicken and egg problems. How do you get a, the first version of a violinist so that now that you have a violinist, you can train other violinists? That process happens through a kind of a process of infection and connection with the world. And it happens in part through migration. Uh, people migrate to your country and start doing things that were not done in that country before. So migration plays an important role. 
diasporas play an important role. You have people from your society living abroad, exposed to other technologies, other ways of doing things, and they somehow infect your country. A foreign direct investment is, a, I love this example, very well documented by a great economist who unfortunately passed away about a decade ago, Stephen Klepper, in Bangladesh, where uh, you know, there was this um, Korean company that wanted to set up shop in Bangladesh, and they took 126 Bangladeshi workers for a six-month training program in Korea. Uh, when these Bangladeshi workers came back, 56 of them left the company to create their own companies. And those 56 companies are the core, not not this Korean company, but the 56 companies set up by these Bangladeshis who were trained for six months in Korea and worked for that company, Th those spread that knowledge uh, through uh, through the system. So, so I it quick, is. The, I have a quick yeah? question about this, Ricardo. So, um, how do you feel about brain drain? Right, one of the uh, concerns that people have with international migration is brain drain, and you can see why. That you know, if you are, um, uh, you know, one of the members of a very large rising middle class in a country like Nigeria you uh, face real limits and obstacles to your productivity in the country mm. and you still face a lot of security threats. You might be able to get an H-1B and come to the United States. And so on one kind of level of analysis, um, this can be a very bad thing for Nigeria, perhaps a wonderful person for this person, but their talents and their energy and so on now go to making the United States even richer rather than in helping Nigeria close that economic gap. On the other hand, on your analysis, Perhaps it's enough for one out of four, one, one out of five of these immigrants to go back to Nigeria 20 years later and start a new company with, uh, you know, the, whatever high technology they may have acquired in Silicon Valley or um, whatever other kinds of, uh, you know, industrial knowledge we may be able to bring back. And perhaps in the long run, that's actually better for Nigerian economic growth. So, so how do you, you know, how do you pass the literature on, on that topic? What side of it do you fall on? Well, I think uh, both both sides uh, have some truth. That is, uh, um, if you do not live in a complex society with this division of labor, then then you as a specialist have no one to collaborate with. And so you, the returns to your education are very low. If you go back to Nigeria, say, as a nuclear uh, scientist, uh, you know, there's very few other people that you can collaborate with to do things. However, so, 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 so knowledge tends to concentrate in, in some places, but a, a, the second logic is also very important. Because you moved out, you connected Nigeria to these other places, right? You, a, you, a, you ha now have people you know in Nigeria that you are connecting with people you know in your place. You might a, open up professional um, opportunities. You might notice different ways of doing things that could be done in Nigeria, so you might invest back in Nigeria, you might uh, um, allow Nigeria to export things to markets that they would not have otherwise connected to. So, so um, diasporas can play a very, very significant role. Uh, Annalisa Xenian has these, these, this research, she's a professor at Berkeley, uh, showing you know the impact of the Indian diaspora, um, the um, uh, the Korean diaspora, the Taiwanese diaspora, in, in transforming their countries of origin. So what I want to say there is that we've looked in detail into a, a migration policies in developing countries. And developing countries are amazingly close to immigration and with a particular bias against high-skill immigration. So you may not be able to prevent your people from leaving, but you're using the coercive power of the state to prevent skilled people from coming in. Uh, and, and, and it's quite amazing uh, the degree to which countries do it. For example, uh, Panama has 29 professions that are reserved to citizens. If you want to be a university professor at a public university, you need to be a citizen. Uh, and there are all sorts of obstacles to becoming a citizen. So, so in some sense, you're 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 using the coercive power of the state to keep knowledgeable people from coming into your country. South Africa is another extreme example. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are happening in South Africa that are scaring many talented people away. But if you if non-South Africans want to live in South Africa, if they are skilled, 
it's it's a super headache because the obstacles are not just at the border, but in you know in every prof in, in in every company that has to abide by by employment rules and so on. So oh, I, I I would tell you, I would tell you, um, it is it is really important uh, that countries um, connect to uh, to the knowledge, whether it's from your uh, your diaspora or from knowledge in general. I mean, uh, Venezuela is a country that was dramatically transformed by the immigration that followed the oil boom that started in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. We had, you know, by 1960, some 700,000 Spaniards, Italians, Portuguese, uh, Europeans more in general, and they were like uh, 10 times more likely to be entrepreneurs than than Venezuelans, even though uh, they had on average slightly less years of schooling than Venezuelans, but uh, they brought knowledge about you know professions, uh, craftsmanships, and so on that that were not in the system, but that permeated the system, and you know within a generation that knowledge just spread to to society as a whole. Well, and and we see the entrepreneurial spirit of immigrants often in many contexts, right? I mean, even in the United States, where presumably on average, immigrants coming to the United States, are, you know, some of them are very highly skilled, but they're coming to a society that's at the technological frontier, right? That's one of the most technologically sophisticated society in the world, and yet they end up founding companies at, at a really overproportional rate. So that's really interesting. I was struck when I was in, in Singapore briefly in the spring, uh, that they seem to have the kind of inverse policy, which is to say that it's a society and an economy that's obviously very open with a large number of expats living there. Um, but when I, uh, uh, not to sound like a, a, a different uh, opinion writer who writes about economics sometimes, uh, you know, took a cap or uh, took grabs, as they're called, they're the local uh, equivalent of Uber, they were all Singaporean citizens. And eventually I asked, you know, Oh, I mean, you know, it's striking that everybody here seems to be Singaporean. One of them used to be a kind of newspaper executive who, you know, was uh, lost his job when, when newspapers became less profitable. And there he was, you know, driving a grab and said, oh, yes, this is a reserve profession. In Singapore, you're only allowed to drive a cab if you're a Singaporean citizen. So it seems to be the inverse. You can come in and be a banker or a consultant yeah. from anywhere in the world. But to drive a cab, you have to be a local citizen. It's actually interesting that that's the inverse of a policy that many mm -hmm. countries pursue. Um you have written something that's skeptical about uh, the role of fighting corruption and economic growth. You're obviously appalled by corruption. You obviously think it's good to have less corruption, but you think that we are too reliant on the idea that if only we were able to get rid of corruption, that would really allow us to have economic growth. Why is that? Especially because, thinking of Singapore again, we have some examples in which uh, you know, effective anti-corruption policies do seem to have set countries up for that kind of economic growth, at least on the popular narrative of uh, what explains the economic development. Why do we sometimes over-index on fighting corruption as a key to economic growth? So uh, let me say that uh, this is is part of a general thing. I, I think economics has, has uh, put enormous emphasis on incentives. And in some sense, uh, economics has been redefined as the science of incentives. And a, a, so we have a very, very a delicate palette for different kinds of incentive problems. And we have moral hazard, adverse selection, asymmetric information, a, the common pool problem. We, we have a, a long palette of, of different incentive problems. And you might say, see, the problem with corruption is that it distorts incentives. And, and, and consequently, people, if you live in a corrupt society, you know that it's not uh, your uh, doing things well that gets you anywhere. It's, you know, getting where the money is and so on. So it, it, it distorts all the incentives in society. And, you know, uh, I have no problem with having a science of incentives. What economics has less of is a science of capabilities. Incentives is, you know, is, do you have, do you want to do something or not? Capabilities is, can you do something or not? And I would say that a lot of the problems in the public sector is lack of capabilities. It's that these uh, public agencies don't have the capacity to do what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and and uh, we often 
attribute those lacks of capabilities to a problem of corruption. And so the agenda is to attack corruption with the idea that if you eliminated corruption, suddenly you would have capable organizations. But very often what happens is that in the process of attacking corruption, you create new forms of transaction costs, uh, uh, new controls on government procurement, new controls on ways of doing things and second guessing people's intentions that makes organizations even harder to perform. So uh, in my mind, uh, I think the main problem is lack of a capable state um, and a, a state that is Uncap incapable, it's also incapable of controlling its own agents. Uh, and consequently, its agents steal or allow others to steal or do other things. But in some sense, because the state is not capable. So uh, I, I would um, uh, put the accent on let's build a capable state. And maybe in the process of building the capable state, we'll have to deal with corruption. But I'm much less of a friend of the idea that if we deal with corruption, a capable state will emerge. I mean, there's, there, there's a political corollary to this, which is that often the politicians who most promise to get rid of corruption uh, turn out to be very corrupt or authoritarian themselves. Um, uh, you know, many uh, 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 of the most ruthless authoritarian leaders today, from Xi Jinping to uh, MBS in Saudi Arabia, uh, rose. Uh, to power and consolidated power in part with anti-corruption drives and uh, you know a key element of uh, populist politics from Donald Trump uh, to uh, uh, you know Narendra Modi and beyond has been the promise to get rid of corruption uh, uh, which often ended up being betrayed so I'm somewhat sympathetic to this argument I also recall a kind of smart argument that I once saw some economists make to say that if you have really bad regulations and they're applied in a very, very consistent way, then it just becomes impossible to uh, you know, get a building permit for a factory that might actually have great economic benefits. If you're able to bribe somebody to get the factory built, it might actually be good for the society. So I, I, I'm somewhat open to this counterintuitive case. Um, but, but I guess I do wonder, um, you know, are you ca is it possible to build a capable state unless you fight corruption. And if a society is incredibly corrupt and you build more state capacity, doesn't that just mean that the richest people in the country are gonna be even better able to enrich themselves at the expense of society? So what does it mean to build state capacity in a significantly or highly corrupt environment without taking on corruption more more head-on or without prioritizing that part of state capacity building? Well, you know, uh, you're trained as a philosopher and philosophy uh, loves to make uh, distinctions between concepts. And I would put it to you that corruption is just uh, too broad a concept, too amorphous a concept uh, to really uh, guide uh, strategy and guide policy. Uh, in some countries, they make a distinction between what they call speed money, which is when you pay a government official to do what the government official is supposed to do. Uh, so it's not that you are asking the government official to violate the law. You're just asking the government official to do his job. And right. you pay I want for to get that. a driving that, that... license. They're supposed to give me the driving license. Yeah. I got to pay them, you know, five bucks to actually get the damn driving license. You're right. And that's different from, you know, uh, using uh, the power of the state for uh, own gain and, and so on. I would put it to you that uh, uh, some of the answers to problems of corruption uh, is less about government enforcement and more about uh, the nature of the political game. For example, in many countries, um, you know, if you think of uh, political scientists like uh, uh, Bruce Bueno de Mesquita, so he has this idea that you know uh, all all governments are have a what they, he calls a selectorate, and and you have to keep uh, the people in the in the ruling coalition happy, um, and. Um, if you if you don't keep them happy, they'll overthrow you. That's what makes them the the, the ruling coalition. They, those are the people you need to stay in power. 
So depending on the way the political system is structured, those might be a hundred people, a thousand people, a million people, 10 million people. So if there are few, you can keep them happy uh, by just, uh, you know, with a billion dollars, you can keep a uh, hundred people happy. You can give them each one of them $10 million. Uh, but with a billion dollars, you, you can't do much for, you know, uh, a large uh, polity because it's very little money per capita. So uh, the bigger the polity, uh, the, the more incentives you have to keep many, many people happy. And that will give you incentives, say, to control uh, corruption. But if, if the game is very narrow, then you don't really care about output and GDP and productivity and so on, because, because you can keep the ruling coalition happy with just a fraction of that. And in some sense, you know, it, it's my interpretation of what the hell happened in Venezuela. The, Venezuela is a country that has an income per capita, which is about a fourth of what it was, a fourth. It came down 75% from where it was a decade ago, and these rascals are still in power. And the thing is that, you know, the rest of, you know, screwing the rest of society doesn't really matter so long as you keep, you know, the army and the police and, 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 you know, a, a small group of people happy enough. And if in the process you, you subvert everything else, doesn't matter because there's no forces that are are going to be able to take you out. So in that case, you would say, do you want to fight corruption? Is corruption the frame? Or is the frame something uh, different and corruption is just one of the symptoms that this underlying problem is generating? That, that, that does sound very, very convincing to me. Um, I have a last thing that, 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 that I want to ask you about before we wrap up, which is a topic we've sort of been skirting in various ways, relationship between uh, economics and uh, democracy. You, you, you've argued that democracy is in fact key to economic growth, but it's not, not a coincidence that a lot of the richest countries in the world are democratic. Um, I'll, I'll put you a question that a student of mine put me recently uh, in the context of liberalism, liberal democracy, which is, well, what about China? China is a society that is not democratic, that is not liberal, that's had tremendous economic growth in uh, the last decades, has raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It's a very impressive place. Um, uh, is that the exception to the rule? Uh, is, does that show that the rule is wrong? Does that somehow, is that the exception that proves the rule? Or is China not going to be able to sustain that increase in prosperity? Certainly right now, China seems to be in some real amount of economic trouble with uh, uh, you know, a real crisis in its real estate sector with significant youth unemployment, very high youth unemployment, actually. Uh, are we seeing the end of the Chinese economic miracle in part because the non-democratic growth part is coming to an end? How do we make sense of the relationship between democracy and economic growth, particularly when we think about an important example like China? So I think, uh, you know, a political scientist will have a, a very, you know, delicate palette for different ways of organizing parliamentary presidential systems and so on. I, I tend to look at dif a different aspect of how the political system is organized. I ask myself a question. Look, uh, a state has thousands of government agencies. It needs to write and interpret millions of pages of legislation. How who's monitoring these government agencies, who's uh, reading these millions of pages of legislation and complaining about contradictions between, you know, catch-22 situations here and there? What is the social process whereby a, a feedback is being generated into the system? And you might say, oh, well, it's very simple. It's elections. Well, no, really no, because elections is, you know, you ask one voter, you know, is it D or an R, you know, or left or right. This does not have the bandwidth that uh, that the system needs in order to to improve on itself, in order to to you know, put stuff on the agenda and so on. So, so you really need a whole social process whereby a, a society can influence. Uh, the way different agencies are run, the way different laws are written, etc. And the question is, what is that mechanism through which society is engaged in the management of policy? Now, in the case of China, they have an interesting uh, system. They have a highly competitive, if you want, meritocracy, uh, 
where, a, you know, you start in the Communist Party, they'll send you to be the mayor of a small village, then they'll send you to be a mayor of a more important city, and then you'll become provincial governor, and then you'll be, a, you'll go to the central committee and whatever. In that process, you're being judged by your ability to generate economic prosperity, jobs, and things like that. So uh, you, when you get to those positions, you want to be very aware and in touch with what are the needs uh, that, uh, that you know, the business community might have in order for you to promote development in, in your area. So, so that aspect of the system makes it quite responsive and very different from, say, the Great Leap Forward in China, where it was exact opposite. It was that they, they had the idea of what they wanted to do. Uh, society was saying, this is not working. We're starving to death. Tens of millions of people starved to death, and they, they wouldn't change the policy. Uh, so so um, I think that there are aspects of, of the Chinese political system that makes them a little bit more responsive. It is because they they have accepted the idea that uh, the legitimacy of of the state depends on uh, go, jo uh, job creation, and that job creation is not something the state can do directly, but only indirectly. Uh, however, I do believe that uh, uh, you know uh, China is is going to face problems that uh, uh, it's uh, we saw it in the way they managed COVID nineteen. Uh, we are seeing it in the way they've managed, say, their their internet uh, success stories, their their unicorns. Uh, you know, they've generated too much power in society for the party to be comfortable. So I do believe that they are going to be paying a cost uh, to to uh, because of that. But I also think that there are many many uh, other political systems that are formally democracies that maybe in your polity for and so on, they get counted as democracies, but have not generated this mechanism through which society can have a useful conversation as to how public issues should be managed. That's, that's, that's fascinating. Um, uh, as a last question, uh, you know, if you're a citizen of the United States or if you're a citizen of Argentina, or perhaps if you're a citizen of, of, of Nigeria, what policies should you ask for? What policies should you fight for if you want more economic growth? I think uh, the, um, it, 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 societies are the, this complex entity, and um, many parts of society are going to need different things in order for say their industry to be able to survive if you if you want to be exporting fresh produce you need you know a cold chain uh, you need a green lane in customs uh, you need phytosanitary permits. You need a, a, you know, a way to certify good agricultural practices. You need a whole set of government provided things that are key for the success of that industry. A diverse society will have a diversity of those things. So it's really, it's not like, um, uh, there's, uh, you know, you take vitamin C and you'll be happy ever after. It's, it's that you need to create this capacity. I, we call it high bandwidth policies, this capacity for society to express uh, the importance of some public goods that are key and highly complementary to, uh, to those activities. And, 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 you know, a prosperous society has many of these channels through which society can influence uh, the conduct of, of public policy. Ricardo, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. No, thank you for having me.